Listen, we are drag racers. You know why we're drag racers? We like our panels to be flipping straight when we get back from the past. Yeah. <laughs> I like that y'all don't shy away from that stuff too. A lot of motorsports companies will not entertain any type of politics. They say you don't talk about race, religion, politics, and money, right? So mm -hmm. uh, if you ever want to have another podcast, maybe we'll get together and talk about all four. Right? Oh boy. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> That's our goal. We want to make racing feels great again, and we want to take care of those that have taken care of us. Man, I like the dress stuff. I like the way when you go to an event, the way it smells because of all the tires. Oh, dude, stuff. if it's the right tires, though. You get bad tires, and it smells so bad. Okay, well, I've only had the good experience. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good, that's good. See how you do under pressure, oh. Yeah, I've been wanting this shit forever. I've been in the field with whatever they throw at me. Brush it off, pick myself up, moving on to the better. Okay. Welcome back to the number one drift podcast on YouTube presented by Njuku Racing. My name is Dawson and today we have new and back. If you want to introduce yourself a little bit. Oh, hey, I'm Ron Finney. I'm the uh, tech director here at Renegade Race Fuels. Yep, he should look familiar to you guys. My name is Toby Baptiste. I'm the founder of Renegade Performance Fuels, Racing Fuels and Lubricants. Awesome. Yeah, we're going to dive a little bit deeper today on kind of the backstory of the company and also some questions and stuff that I missed from the last podcast as well. Uh, but of course, before we get into it, look below the video, make sure the subscribe button is not still red. If it is, go ahead and click that and hit the bell notification while you're at it uh, so you never miss an episode. Uh, and along with that, the Grassroots Hero hats are available on 144 Racing now. Uh, not the blue one, sorry. We got the red ones out. If you do want to see a blue one, though, let me know in the comments, and we can probably make that happen. Uh, and then along with that, the Grassroots Hero and Grip Royal steering wheels that just dropped. You can not only get a Grassroots Hero steering wheel, but customize it to your color preference, uh, even like suede or leather, stuff like that. So check those out on 144 Racing as well. Uh, and then don't forget about the Chase Bays event at the end of the month. Grab your tickets if you haven't already. Links to that are in the description. And then last one, Valino, 35% off sale. Grab your tires. Those are important. Uh, and I want to say this. SEMA screwed me up, so if I sound like an 11-year-old boy going through puberty throughout this one, I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but we're good. Just losing my voice. Um, but this is Renegade, like they just said. Uh, so if you want to start with the last questions that I missed from the, the last pod. That'll probably be more directed towards you, Ron. But, all righty. All right. Um, well, the main one that I missed is how to properly store not only fuel, but more or less ethanol. Yeah, it's a great question because ethanol is hygroscopic, tends to draw moisture. So keeping it in a sealed container is the best thing to do. Um, if you're going to store over the winter, like if the vehicle's going to sit, you know, if you can drain the tank out, that's probably the best way to do it and just put some regular fuel in. Oh, uh, really? But if you leave, if you're going to leave the ethanol in there or an E85 mix in there, E85 is pretty durable fuel. It's only, uh, it, you know, with the 15% gas in there, if it gets a little bit of moisture contamination, it'll still start in the spring and you can run that out. And, right. You know, I wouldn't go directly to the racetrack with it, but you can run that out with really little to any issues at all. Um, but there is some fuel conditioner you can put in uh, that helps extend the life of E85 if you're going to, mm. Let one sit for six months or so. Might do you not all sell that yourself idea. too? We do not. No. Uh, there's some companies that specialize in the ethanol uh, conditioner line. Who so. would you suggest probably? Um, not real familiar with. Uh, I know a couple of our competitors have a couple of products on the market, but I think anything um, like most products like that, they're probably coming from one source and just relabeled. Gotcha. Um, gotcha. So anything that um, would extend the life if you're going to have a vehicle that's sitting six, seven months at a time. Uh, you know, some parts of the country, you know, there's only two or three good months to run up uh, yeah. when you get up north. So, uh, but other than that, uh, what I usually recommend to folks, if you can get to the fuel tank vent, uh, put a piece of tape over it. That'll keep air from circulating in and out of the tank. Uh, don't seal it off solid because if pressure would build up or if it gets really cold and pressure drops, like we talked about drums on the last podcast, it could suck the tank in. Mm -hmm. So uh, the tape will either suck in or push off if the pressure gets too high. Okay. So, but keeping a piece of tape over the fuel tank vent uh, reduces the air circulation through it, and the air obviously is carrying the moisture. So, if you can reduce that, you get a little bit better service life out of your ethanol products. Oh, that's good. Okay. I think one of the products is called Heat, isn't it? In a yellow bottle. Treat yeah, that was for the gasoline antifreeze stuff. Okay. Okay. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, and yeah. it you know can be added too. Um, but yeah, they make a, a product just for. Um, extending the life of ethanol. I think it reduces some of the growth. I mean, like diesel fuel, you'll get an algae growth in it. 
I think mm. with ethanol, you'll get some degradation in there, some bacterial degradation, and it'll actually uh, help reduce. Okay. Uh, now, would what about like keeping it in the actual jugs, just the regular race jugs? Would that be considered a bad idea for yeah, long term? If you can avoid keeping it in plastic jugs, uh, you know, like we mentioned the last podcast, plastic breathes. Plastic is mm. actually porous, which is a weird concept because I know I put my fuel in and carry it and it's not dripping all over me, okay? <laughs> um, but it does breathe. So, and again, the, the moisture's in the air. So if it's breathing, it's getting air in there. Um, that could promote some moisture in there. So it's a really good idea if you can get it out of the plastic jugs and put it back in a drum or in a sealed pail where you can seal it up a little bit tighter. Um, mm. That's going to be a little better long-term storage for the ethanol than keeping it in your plastic jugs. Yeah, yeah. Now, let's say, like, for some reason someone didn't store it properly uh, or they just didn't know how. How long would you consider that you have for the fuel to still be considered good? It's really going to depend on what it's exposed to. I mean, if it's a high humidity, uh, you know, area like down in the coastline, down Houston, down in Texas, wherever there's a lot of oh, humid, yeah, heat and humidity, um, you know, that can create more moisture concerns than if you were up in Nebraska or Montana where, you know, it's a lot drier. True. So that's going to vary a little bit. Um, it, it's one of those things, like I tell folks, uh, you know, try to run a little bit. I wouldn't go to the track and run it. Mm -hmm. um, but again, the car probably will fire up. It's not going to draw that much moisture where you got like water, a lot of liquid water. I mean, you've got other issues if you're getting that <laughs> right, much right. moisture. Okay. <laughs> um, but a little bit of moisture into the car may not perform quite as well, or, you know, it, maybe it has a, cutting out just a little bit of whatever, a little bit of a stumble could be a sign of, you know, some really degraded fuel that maybe it's got a higher moisture content. Mm. Um, but I, you know, like I told folks, you know, untape the vent, take it out in the spring, you know, drive it around. Use up that fuel to warm up and then put some fresh fuel in and, and then do whatever it is you're going to do that weekend or that evening. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I guess when fuel goes bad, it's more or less just the amount of like water that builds up within it? Well, with or ethanol, it like yeah, it can be both the water buildup and a little bit of the, the degrading of the product itself. So okay. most ethanol products like E85, you know, we say it's good for a year and a half if it's stored fairly, you know, fairly properly. Uh, the race fuels are a little over two years. You know, we've had guys go way wow. longer than that. Um, to your, I didn't expect it to be that long, honestly. Yeah, to your, yeah a good race fuel product should store over two years easily. Um, wow. Again, that, that's a testament to what we build the fuel with. But, um, you know, with the ethanol products, if um, if they're stored properly a year, year and a half, shouldn't be an issue. I mean, we take a lot of cars. I mean, people fill up their tank, and they may go a month before they get gas again if they're driving just around town or yeah. whatever with the E85. And as we've talked about before, the pump grade E85 is not as good a quality product as what a race grade E85 is. Um, so with the compounds that are in it and the quality of the, the product we use, um, it should have a pretty good shelf life on there. Uh, to answer your question, if, you know, if it does start to go bad, the ethanol over time will break down a little bit. Some mm -hmm. of the components will start to, you'll get some vaporizing off of the lighter end components in the alcohol. Uh, you get a little bit of degradation of the remaining contents of the alcohol, just like gasoline. Gasoline will break down over time. Yeah. And a lot of it's the additives and things that are put into the gasoline. Um, but, and, and the evaporation takes some of the components off into the atmosphere. So that all changes the quality of the gas and how the fuel is going to perform. Before we get into the rest of that conversation, I wanted to drop in and let you guys know that the new Grassroots Hero hats are on the 144 Racing's website. Nice surf cap with the rope on the front. They're like a almost dry fit material. So they're really comfortable, especially wearing them all day at the track and stuff. So if you're interested, grab one of those off the website. Grab a shirt as well if you haven't already. And let me know, would you want to see these hats in black or even possibly blue? I'm really digging the blue one. I don't know about you, but I'm not gonna hold up any more of your time. If you wanna grab some, they are on 144 Racing. Go check them out in the description. Other than that, let's get back to the podcast. Gotcha, okay. Uh, and as far as like oils and stuff go, I assume that's like relatively common sense to store. Obviously it comes in a container that's sealed and everything, so you don't open that, you're fine, right? But um, if you did like leave a half empty jug of oil there, does that really deteriorate, or is that just kind of yeah, as long good as to go, it, as long as the oil's sealed, the jug's sealed, you'll be fine. Okay. Uh, seal the quart back up, seal the jug back up, you'll be fine. But you know that's the age old question: Does oil really go bad? And typically, uh, most of us have thought for years, you know, oil is good for the life of the product. Um, but actually, when you talk to the chemical engineers, over time, long term, 
uh, storage, you know, three, four, five years on oil. Some of the additives that are in the oil, because there's a lot of detergents, dispersants, anti-foaming agents, uh, mm. anti-corrosion agents and stuff that are in there. Just like any chemical, they will degrade over time. They will start to break down over time. Uh, and so with the oil, like I said, proper storage, it's a pretty durable product. You know, throw it on the shelf yeah, in the garage, yeah. and, and like I said, you're good. Uh, but again, as it as it ages out, and we're talking pretty long term, not a year or two, but you know, longer than that, it can start to degrade as well. So, like anything, a good fresh product's good. You know, mm. wouldn't throw anything out that's uh, a couple years old. But you know, if your buddy wants to sell you a, a case of oil from you know 1976, <laughs> I might want to avoid that. Right, <laughs> right. Keep that as a collector's item. Yeah, <laughs> put it on the shelf, put the bottles up there, and yeah. Um. Okay. Well, and that would be like. Even if it's sealed in the original container with the seal under the cap and everything, mm -hmm. too, right? Okay. Yeah, again, those bottles, you know, plastic bottles and the plastics are going to breathe and stuff. So anything that's coming in that could go out. So, uh, and the base chemicals over time mm -hmm. will tend to, like everything, you know, everything mm -hmm. tends to break down over with right. age. So um, it isn't good to use something that's extremely old from that aspect. Would it work? Yeah, possibly. Would it work as intended? Probably not. So... Again, when we look at the cost of an engine or cost of your pet project versus a case of oil, it's it's yeah. like yeah, it's you know it's not worth it to mm -hmm. to take those chances. Fair enough. Uh, now we did mention in the last podcast about break-in oil, mm -hmm. uh, but we didn't really touch on like a good process for breaking in a fresh build. So on top of using the break-in oil, mm -hmm. what would be a good process that you suggest? Okay, a fresh well, build. yeah, and, and that's a, it's an interesting question, and it's kind of uh, every engine builder has their own thing that they like, but typically across the board, um, you know, you bring the start the engine, bring it up to speed, you try to get it adjusted as quickly as you can. Mm. Um, if it's a flat tap at cam, obviously you've got to keep it above 15, 1800 RPM for the first 20 minutes so that the lifters will rotate and uh, wear the cam lobe in properly. Uh, but bring once you do that, or you know today pretty much everything's roller cams, so that's not as big of an issue. Uh, but getting the engine, bringing it up to temperature, and then cycling it, and then uh, we, we always like to say the first 500 miles, you mm. know, to, for a break-in period. But that doesn't mean get on the interstate and drive 70 for three hours. Uh, you want to you want to change the RPM. It's, it's not bad. You could do the break-in all at once, but you want to vary the RPM. You want to speed it up. You want to slow it right. down. You want to keep those uh, rings moving around, keep the tension changing inside that cylinder so that it's wearing that cylinder nice and as evenly as possible across the entire engine. So, so yeah, a few heat cycles, get some mileage on it, vary the RPM a little bit, try to stay out of the wide open throttle until you get good seating on the rings, and um, it, it should work well for you. Okay. Well, if you do it properly, what would you say a good mileage range would be until you can flush that oil out, go to your normal oil, and take on with the build? Yeah, again, that's a great question. Um, when we look at a race engine or a drag race engine, you know, in our case, we're going to take and we're going to build that engine. We're going to run it on the dyno, probably get four or five pulls on it, put it in the car, and head for the track. So uh, some guys will run the first race on the break-in oil and then change their oil. Oh, wow. Other guys will go ahead and change the oil right after the dyno. So... We've seen a lot of variation on that, um, and I, again, as we, we kind of talked about oil in the first podcast, the ring manufacturers all still want to break in on a mineral-based oil, mm -hmm. yet nobody makes an engine from Detroit. No OEM manufacturer, they're all on synthetic from day one. So right, right. can you, how quickly you change it, I think, has changed over time. I think today, you know, you could break that engine, heat cycle it. Uh, you know, let's say, you know, in this case, we put a new engine in our... I'm going to stay with my Supra with the Jay-Z in it, man. I know I know, I was killing you guys with that, but I'm going to stay with my Supra <laughs> with the Jay-Z in it. We're going to, you know, take that thing out, run it around, break, get that engine broken in, a few heat cycles or whatever. Then I'm probably going to go ahead and put the good race oil in it. I'm going to drain the break-in oil out. Okay. I'd rather be on the good oil, and I think you'd be fine. I think with today's technology on the rings and cylinder finishes and stuff, the break-in time isn't like the old days of the – Hard rings or certainly the old chrome rings uh, <laughs> that, you know, you take forever to break in. And, mm -hmm. you know, you hear horror stories. I don't know. I mean, this goes way back to my dad telling me they'd put chrome rings in and they'd either seal or they wouldn't. And if they didn't seal, 
you're going to take them out and change them because they just wouldn't cut yeah, in. But the there were guys, noise. yeah, the, yeah. The guys were pouring Boraxo cleanser down the intake, <laughs> trying to get some grit in there to seal the rings or whatever. So it's like, that's hilarious. yeah, technology is way better today. So like I said, I, I think a good, you know, heat cycle two or three times, like we do, you know, we're running on the dyno, getting five, six, eight pulls on the dyno and then putting the good oil in and going racing. I think you can do that in just about any engine today with the products that are out there. The rings are so much better. Mm-hmm. The machining is so much better from the machine shops, mm-hmm. the equipment they're using today, and the oil t- is light years different mm-hmm. than it was in the old days. So that that's kind of where I, I think we're at today. Okay. Well, that's good info then. Um, well, besides all of, I guess, more chemical based stuff um what is the most common misconception about just running a fuel company an oil company in general gosh i guess i ought to take that one that one is yeah (laughs) yeah so uh naturally we deal with stuff that catches on fire right and uh blows up so so you got to be real careful right with Mm -hmm. especially with the the safety aspect and stuff of that nature and uh i think as you're aware we had a we, yeah we've experienced that once yeah we, we were not aiming to get into the barbecue business at all. <laughs> and uh we, a good we way to put it. yeah we kind of kind of did that accidentally and uh thankfully though nobody was hurt and yeah. that's the main thing yeah. right uh it, well, it's uh, got to be stressful i mean it's a warehouse full of flammable very stressful so yeah, like yeah and, and and that was our main packaging facility for, so if you look at our oh, core cans yeah our pints, uh, that's where a lot of that was at. So uh, it really put us behind on order fulfillment mm-hmm. and, and really appreciative of, of our renegade tribe out there that stuck with us. We got really behind on orders, uh, but, man, we've had a record year thanks to, that's you know, awesome. thanks to our racers and our distributors, and we're very thankful for that, that they hung in there with us. Uh, so, uh, but yeah, we're, we've been rebuilding ever since it happened. So the new, the new state of the art bowling, uh, facility will go here in Owensboro. Uh, awesome. believe it or not, so the Bowling Green facility, all of our facilities are either in an industrial area or out in the, out in the boonies, right? Okay. The Bowling Green facility is the only facility that's inside of the city. And, and oh. what a lot of folks don't realize, that Bowling Green facility is an old standard oil facility. Yeah, the old Rockefeller oh, facility. Oh, wow. Yeah, so you're talking early 1900s, That's 19 cool. teens. So it was grandfathered in yeah. there, right? So when it came time to rebuild, you know, man, we got a, we got a private school right behind us. Mm. Uh, we have businesses on every side of us there. We were like, hey, we're, we're not going to put flammables, you know, the ball. Yeah. So we're moving it up here to Owensboro. Uh, to, to where the ma- major blend plants at, and, and we'll be rocking and rolling out of there in 2025. Good. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, well, if you don't mind me asking, what was the, like, what caused the scenario? Yeah, happen? just, uh, just it was a grounding issue. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Okay. W- when, you, when you're transferring or dealing with fuels, uh, you, you got to be, you got to be, make sure you're grounded. Right. And, and actually, wow. I guess while we're on, it'd be a good time to talk about racers putting their fuel in their car too. Maybe yeah. you might want to touch on that because it's been a while, but yeah. I think years ago there was a drag racer that was filling his tank with methanol. I think it was Kurt Dameron, right? The old I think it was, yeah. yeah. And I mean, you see cases of like people at the gas pump too, static yeah. electricity and well, stuff. Well, y- you know, they've said for years, uh, be careful, you know, on and you hear it on news stations stuff, talk about it periodically, fill in your gas can for your lawnmower. If you've got one of those plastic bed liners in your truck, in your mm. plastic tank, you know, be careful you slide it mm. on there because the plastic and plastic creates oh. static, just like taking a balloon and rubbing your yeah. head and your hair stands up. So reducing that static discharge, um, you know, I think on our race vehicles, whether it's drift, whether it's drag, whether it's oval track, mm. making sure that fuel cell is grounded. I know most of the sanctioning bodies do. Even if it's a plastic fuel cell, they run a grounding uh, wire up to the metal ring where the cap sits in there. It's not a bad idea to run a wire down into the fuel to, to ground it to so that you've got what you're doing. You're not really grounding it, but it's what we call bonding. You're getting everything oh. to the even potential. And then when you fill it, uh, like we talked about filling the cars, is touching the thing, you know, like taking your gas nozzle and touching it to the ring and mm-hmm. then filling it. Um, you kind of do that in your car when you hit the neck as you're going in. You kind of yeah. create a bonding between. That's why there's no wire from the pump to the car when you fill it. Mm-hmm. But if you see a, a truck like the semis discharging or filling semis, yeah. tanker loads, there'll be a cable that they hook up. And there's a ground control in the rack to make sure wow. that bonding has occurred before they'll allow fuel to exchange. So. You know, I think from that standpoint with racers, just making sure that um, 
a lot of us use plastic jugs and plastic mm. funnels and stuff. Touch everything together and, you know, just try to make sure that you get ready to pour, touch that funnel or whatever, um, you know, and pour easy to start with a little bit. What happens is the faster you pour, the more static you try. It's friction. Static comes from friction. Um, you know, some of you have seen some of the movies, like I think it was Hunt for Red October, where the helicopter comes in and mm -hmm. drops um, Alec Baldwin down. You see that cable they drop down? It's a grounding cable. And it hits the sub, and, man, it was like a lightning bolt flies off because it's trying to do the same thing. They yeah. get a big static discharge uh, from moving the air. So I think anytime you can, you know, we as racers can you know, try to reduce that a little bit, you know, kind of touch things together before we start pouring, uh, mm. things like that will keep them a lot safer. It's one of those things guys will say, hey, you know, I've been doing this for 40 years or whatever. Oh, yeah, of course. It takes one it's time. It's always going to be one of those guys. It, you yeah, know, it, it takes, takes one time. time. Yeah. Yeah, and, and when you're filling up your car, too, something I would suggest is, you know, when you're, when you're at the gas pump, mm -hmm. take your hand just rub it down your car, you know, or, or take your fingers and do that down the car, maybe a, f a few inches and then touch the gas pump in your car at the same time before you grab it. Huh. Yeah. That, that'll give you a little, cause okay. you're right. There has been uh, fires at the gas pump because of static, yeah. a static charge. Mm -hmm. That's so wild. Cause I've never even like, I've never thought about that as far as like the plastic jugs or anything like that. And mm -hmm. I've never had a fuel cell myself or I, everything's been factory tank. So I'm still filling it from the, the factory fill nozzle and everything. Uh, so I've just never yep. literally thought about that when it comes so to So I've got a, car. I, I got a company I do some consulting with. Uh, he's got a business out of Alabama. Okay. He actually lost his daughter daughter in 2019. Oh, no. uh, a lot of people don't realize that like pools and, and he was at a lake house, had a switch, light switch that was on, and they jumped in the water and it electrocuted and, and, and somebody – saved him saved his other daughter but the other daughter had already gone under and so there's uh w when i heard about that i was like jimmy man that, that's that's horrible yeah he says yeah he says you ought to look into that because a lot of them are, are happening in pools where they're not grounding right so now you know if you have a pool what? after researching it really the right way Dude. after <laughs> even after you ground the electrical yeah. Right. You should have a grounding, some kind of grounding rod coming out of your ground, out of the ground, and there the, the you know the copper flimsy, mm -hmm. and it sits in the skimmer basket. Mm -hmm. So that That's they're, crazy. They're, and, and so what I've seen is they got these square copper that uh, squares that mm -hmm. are sitting in a skimmer basket, and it's hooked, and you see it go into mm -hmm. a grounding yeah. wire. So yeah, uh, grounding is a very important thing, and l like Ron said, you know. Uh, even myself, you, you know, you pour fuel into a race car. I've been doing it for years, but mm -hmm. people need to people need to make sure they're doing that. Safely. Absolutely, it takes one time. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. You don't want to experience it. That's sure. exactly right. <laughs> let's take a break from the podcast real quick. Winter build season is finally here, and let's just say if you're still rocking a stock steering wheel, that has to change. I wanted to team up with Crip Oil on this and bring you guys some very clean and simple Grassroots Hero steering wheels. And trust me, it won't be just a lousy one or two different style steering wheels. So if you consider yourself Grassroots and you want to support the podcast by grabbing one of the Crip Oil collab wheels, customize it to the way you and your car are. Make it match. Make your car look good. Go grab a steering wheel. Get back to the podcast. Uh, well, what about like... When it comes to storing it, would having a ground for storing it and like transferring it into your plastic jugs, like would that matter? Grounding's more important on the transfers. Just on, okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's more when you're transferring the fuel. When the mm -hmm. fuel's moving, that's when it's creating the static or picking up the static discharge, gotcha. moving from one container to the other. But, but yeah, it's a you know like if we're filling a drum, you know we'll take and we touch the nozzle to the drum first, and we've got a grounding cable that we clip on the drum. Mm -hmm. But you know you touch the nozzle to the drum first, and then any electrical differential because that, that's what we're doing i mean it's, it's a basic physics everything in nature yeah. tries to reach equilibrium so um you get a build up of positive here and a build up of negative here the two are going to try to equalize and i always told the students you know don't be in the middle right. of that right. when that happens but that's what we're trying to do is just try to reduce that differential so yeah handling the fuel whether it's plastic or don't drag it across the floor of the trailer because you're going to build up static mm. okay carry it across set it down um, but if you're going to transfer some touch the two together that's going to try to equalize, help equalize the potential. Yeah. Um, you know, and it doesn't have to be a long-term hug and kiss with the jugs. 
uh, you know, electricity travels at or near the speed of light. So it happens quick. <laughs> oh, another thing too, don't be on your cell phone when you're, uh, filling, filling, you, you fuel in your race car, putting fuel in your car. Mm-hmm. Uh, we actually had a safety video cause, uh, the challenging thing is when you have a fire like this, you, you get to go present and speak in front of your peers of, <laughs> of, of why that happened, right? Yep. And the how. And uh, there was a, a case in California. It, it was a tanker truck, and he was loading out a rack. And mm. literally, you can see it on camera where he gets on his phone, and, and, and as soon as he puts the phone to his ear, kaplooey. Yeah. Oh, so, my God. Uh, he ended up living, I believe, but it hurt him pretty good, and it, it blew him off the truck. And wow, it, the whole dude. He was able to – I think he broke his uh, – broke. It had to crawl out, and he lived, but the tr- it was a total burn down of the rack in the truck. And you that could see insane. it right when he pulled his, pulled his mm-hmm. phone out and got on it. Wow. Don't blow yourself up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. That sounds like a that's bad a day to me, man. I don't know. Yeah. That's a bad day. <laughs> oh, my God. Okay, well, besides all the depressing side of things – um, what, what were both of you guys doing before Renegade ever even became a thing? Well, let's see here. So that, that's kind of interesting. I was supposed to go to college and play sports and, uh, I got myself in some trouble, right? You know how, when you're playing <sighs> high that. school sports <laughs> and the, the, the daggone papers write about you and you think you're all that, and then you go make a, a stupid mistake and the recruiter looks at you in the eyes and says, young man, we got four or five people just as good if not better than you. So yep. that caused me to get into school. My dad had been racing, street racing, right, doing mm-hmm. the outlaw stuff, the real outlaw stuff, not on TV, you know, back in the day. And then he got into drag racing to get off the streets. And so he came to me and he was like, well – I got a good avenue if you want to get out of the trouble. You're not going to go play sports. You're going to go uh, to JUCO, and you're going to, uh, you know, lose that opportunity to play mm-hmm. sports. So, uh, basically, he said, you want to get into racing? I said, sure. He said, okay. Good. He said, well, you're not going to be pretty boy Floyd and just show up and get in the cockpit. You're going to have to uh, be here through the week to work on the car turn and turn wrenches yeah. and, and contribute financially. And yeah. I didn't, you know, yeah, I, yeah. I was working at the CB grocery store. Uh, after my dad, but he made me, when we had to go pick up our motors, he made me contribute something That's to, good, to yeah. the racing operation. So uh, that kind of pulled me out of that mess I got myself in. Um, we basically got a bad drum of fuel, and uh, I just decided to become a fuel dealer, and then the dealership rolled into a distributorship, and then I was able to uh, run, uh, you've heard of the Coke Brothers? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. They had a race fuel program, believe it or not, in 2000, 1999, 2000, 2001. Oh, okay. And they, uh, after I got into the distributorship side, they brought me in to run, you know, seven states of racing fuel for them. And that went awesome. And uh, they were one of the first ones to get into low, low sulfur diesel. And basically, they had one tank. Mm. I believe that's how that worked. They had one tank for race fuel, but they needed a tank to make it in. And so they just pulled the race fuel program out and put this new fuel oh, in there. Yeah. Okay. So but the, the cool thing about that, though, I was able to learn about manufacturing. Mm-hmm. And so you got, you know, there's a big difference from being a distributor, but right. then learning how to make the biscuits, right? And, and, yep. and, and put them in the bag and, and distribute them out. So that was cool. And then I, I came back and uh, got a got a partnership, established a partnership with Mr. Gary Emick, uh, which... Uh, He's the owner of Valor Oil, and we created a partnership and decided we're going to start manufacturing racing fuels. So uh, a lot of people don't realize this. For years, we made racing fuels for other companies and their other brands. Yeah. And uh, didn't we talk about that a little bit? We did talk about that a little bit. Okay. So I knew that we do some VPL stuff, but yeah, that's actually, they started doing that long before the, that he formed the Renegade yeah, brand. Yeah, yeah. So, gotcha. and, okay. and, and, and basically what started happening is, I, you know, I, I like the name of your hat, Grassroots, by the way. That's kind of what we pride, pride ourselves on. So I just noticed that, and I have nothing against a professional racer, mm-hmm. but they're a small percentage of racing. And it seemed like the the Grassroots racers were kind of getting poo-pooed on. And yeah. so if we were making this cup. they're all. I would say they're almost glorified in drifting, well, which is ironic. Yeah, yeah. So, But if we were making this for another company and we would – make it easy here if we went up if prices went up say uh 10 percent mm-hmm. the people we were making stuff for they would go up 50 percent 
So I felt like the, oh. the overall grassroots racers were kind of getting yeah. poo-pooed on. And so I just said, hey, let's create our own brand and be focused on what I consider the majority of racing. And we just wanted, we, we, we made the decision to create Renegade and be the official fuel of grassroots racing. That's super cool. So that's, that's like kind of that. how Renegade. It's a very unique way to go after yeah. it too. Yeah, yeah. Especially compared to all the, the other big fuel companies out there. All they do is, it seems, go after the pro guys, which I get, if, especially if you're focused on more of <clears throat> the drifting side of things. Um, I don't really think any other professional motorsports other than NASCAR is, has a big enough audience, I would say, to really make a difference, right? You think? Well, <laughs> you know, for, people have different perspectives on that. Right, right. For, 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 for us, it's who are the guys and gals that are, you know, working 40, 50, 60 hours a week racing on their grocery money. Mm -hmm. Who's busting their A double to get there to the track? And we want to we wanna help those guys. And, and so could we up our pricing up so high? that it takes care of all these professional programs, we could. Mm -hmm. But you know what? I would rather give you the best product, the best technology at a fair price, and you spend your money how you want to spend it instead of us spending it for you. Gotcha. That's pretty much it, it in a nutshell. Yep. Awesome. Well, have you gotten any, like, um, <coughs> uh, I guess, stories from some of the grassroots guys that you've helped in the past that have helped complement that, I guess, way of going about the business? Well, I, I, I believe that shows in how we've grown over the last several mm -hmm. years, okay? And uh, so when you look at our development operationally from where we started to where we're at, at our you know, blend plant next door, you know, that's because people are making the change. You know, sure. so, and it, you know, it's on our website. We have folks that live, list testimonials and, and ratings and stuff of that nature. But I, here's the, here, here's the deal. And this is why I've got my make racing feel great again. And my red cap, go to great cap, great cap, baby, uh, is that's our goal. We want to make racing feels great again. And we want to take care of those that have taken care of us. That's so cool, dude. Makes me proud to be even a part of it too. Cause I mean, like I just said, you see all the other companies putting such a heavy focus on pros. Yeah. And my whole podcast is about grassroots stuff. So, well, then we're it in line, suits, here, bro. Dude, we're this in suits line. So man. well. Um, okay. Well, as far as um, cars and stuff, what what actual cars have you owned and that you've personally used your own product on? Yeah, so I've got a similar uh, car to the professor here. I got a rear engine dragster. Right, and awesome. we we very we pride ourselves on our methanol being the cleanest in the industry. So I run our racing methanol in it. It's uh, it, what makes it the cleanest? Just so. Well, one, uh, it's got dedicated usage on how it gets here. Okay. Uh, it's not going through a you know I'm not trying to degrade any kind of chemical companies, but we're not touching yeah, yeah. it or running it through um, areas that have other chemicals. So we 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 pride ourselves on the purity of it. Uh, you know, you can have methanol that says it's 99% pure, but that's from a moisture standpoint. Mm -hmm. A lot of times it don't factor the chemical contaminants in it. Yeah. And uh, I pri we pride ourselves on our filtration units that are here that we run the process through. And so in the methanol world, you can get what you call the white worming effect. Uh, you can get pitting in your motors and stuff of that nature if you don't have an ultra pure methanol mm. so yeah uh in and, and, and our oil complements our methanol too uh we don't have in the methanol world with with oil you can have what you call a lot of milk shaking where okay. a, lot, a lot of methanol gets in your oil and the thing is uh to, to add to what he was talking about with oil uh, people need to realize oil is like the blood in your body okay yep. so are we going to contaminate would you want to contaminate the blood in your body? No. Nope. So, you know, if, if we contaminate that oil uh, with methanol, then you, you don't have oil in its purest form going through that motor. Mm -hmm. So uh, we pride ourselves on that. When you run our oil and you run our methanol, you're not going to get a lot of methanol in our oil, which means you have a, a pure oil running through the system of the motor. That's good. Okay. Yeah. Got anything you want to add on that? No, I was just going to say, I run on the racing gas side, and uh, he, he does, he's being a little modest, he's got a top sportsman car, too, that runs on our pro nitrous extreme, mm. um, 
very beautiful car. It was featured in the, it was actually in the catalog for PRI a couple of years ago oh, nice. from our booth. Yeah, it's a beautiful Camaro. Uh, purple, obviously, co- mm. company color. Uh, they've got a bracket Vega that can run the gas classes or, or a bracket race that runs on the race gas. So um, so we run, a, through the company, we run a pretty good complement of, of all of our products. Um, probably one of the neatest things, I, I think, is you know, you're talking about a testament to our product and We've had a lot of guys come up and, and a lot of compliments, you know, on the product. But one of them was, and, and it was the Cinderella story two years ago of, of the super, the 2022 Super Gas World Champion, Bob Locke. Mm-hmm. He was leading the points, uh, came in the last couple of races of the year was Vegas and Pomona. He had to go there and do really well to try to win the world championship. And we all, mm-hmm. he was a local racer. He's, he's my tax accountant. <laughs> him and his son race locally and they've never he's never won a national event never done any of that and uh, we're like dude this is your year you've got to do it so we kind of all just in, really strongly encouraged him to go so he he makes a trip and, and if you haven't seen it uh, watch the nhra cast of it it's really cool and they they did a big story on him and, and what he had to do bottom line is he did okay in vegas but not very well went to pomona had to win the whole thing mm-hmm. had to beat previous world champion had to not only um, do well, but win the event, his first national event ever to win the world championship, and he did on our Renegade Pro 112. The cool story was, though, when I first, when Bob first came to us to switch, um, some of his friends were using our product that we sold, our distributorship had sold to him, and so he'd ordered a drum of 112, and we sold it to him. So we show up at Columbus, Ohio, National Trail Raceway, and uh, the wife and I were walking through the pits, and Bob runs super gas. We run super comps, so we're in different classes. Mm. So we roll up to watch some of our friends and him and everybody run super gas. We're, we get about halfway to the lanes, and here comes Bob making a beeline to us. I'm like, oh, crap. <laughs> what, you know, what's wrong? Yeah. And he comes up, and he says, hey, i got to ask you a question. I'm like, okay. And he says, is it normal? My heart sunk. <laughs> oh, God. You know, here I talk to this guy <laughs> buying our fuel. It's never a way to start it. <laughs> yeah. And he, he says, is it normal for a car not to vary a thousandth in three or four runs back to back on your fuel? And I went, well, we do pride ourselves on burns cooler, cleaner, and more consistent. Mm-hmm. So, whew, yeah, <laughs> consistency is a good thing. So it was it was a really cool testament, and you know we hear that time and time again about the consistency of the product and how well the cars run um, on there. So again, we take a lot of pride in that because it it's the guys like yourself, guys like us that are out there. You know, trying to do a day job and out there beating it on the weekends and, and trying mm-hmm. to enjoy when we can race. Uh, you know, we're probably not going to ever go out and get a professional sponsorship and, and make the world tour. Um, so, uh, again, kind of going back to reinforcement, as you've asked, of our what we do. Uh, there's nothing better than hearing from our racers. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and absolutely. I think we've got a world championship on just about every level of racing and we just found out one of our boat racers had won um, in 11 season, won six national championships in a in an outboard boat series that runs our fuel. Tell me about I didn't that a little that, bit, man. That's pretty dang the cool. The boat stuff, that's that's yeah, insane. Yeah, they do uh, they do the boat racing and they run these outboards in these. Uh, and I don't know a lot about it. We've been wanting to go see them because uh, you know yeah. I've seen it on TV and watched a, a few. We used to go to the regatta and watch the big hydroplanes run. Um, but yeah, we, we've been selling this guy, our HR 93, um, and that so they run 93 in those it's things? a 93 in these outboard engines and, huh. uh, and we didn't realize it, but we found out in talking to his dad that, yeah, they'd won six championships since they'd been on our fuel. And it's like, wow, that's so yeah. cool. That is cool, isn't it? Well, that's such a unique, like bragging, right? Cause I mean, I don't, I've never heard of any of the other companies, digging into the weird motorsports like that everything you see is all obviously like motocross or Mm -hmm. um drag racing of course and then drifting man i like the drift stuff i like the way when you go to an event the way it smells because of all the tires oh dude if it's the right tires though you get bad tires and it smells so bad okay well i've only had the good experience (laughs) (laughs) that's good that's good Um, i don't know that one yet yeah have you ever ridden in a car yet uh, I, yeah, I went with, uh, uh, it was SEMA two years ago. Uh, I can't remember the guy's name, but he had a, he had a truck running King of the Hammers. He had a drift car. He was a guy that, uh, drove like three or four cars and I got a video mm-hmm. on it somewhere. I can't remember his name, but I have been in one. It was awesome. Was it possibly the RTR team? I, I don't remember. 
Okay. I don't remember. Fair enough. <laughs> I'll try to get back with you, Because I got the video saved on my, in, in my phone. Oh, yeah, okay. Text messages. Cool. Yeah. Well, that's good. You've at least experienced it yeah. before. Yeah. How, did you ever get to? I have, I've been in a drift car, but I haven't done the drifting. I haven't been around the track, but we were oh. we were at a uh, doing some training at a local college, and they had mm. a couple of the cars there, and the guy's like, you know, we were checking them all out, and it's kind of a whole different territory for me. Yeah. And he's like, well, he says, you got to drive it. And I'm like, seriously? He goes, oh, yeah, you got to take it out. So we went out flogging around the little bit of neighborhood there and back through the parking lot, and uh, I had uh, one of my instructors with me uh, from the college, and, you know, he was pinned to the door, scared the whole time. And, you know, I'm banging the gears. I used to drive, you know, a stick. So I can shift gears pretty yeah, good. Yeah. So I'm hammering through the gears, although it was a little different with the RPM and the winding of the four-cylinder and the turbo spooling. And, you know, it was kind of cool. But almost took out a curb and another car on the way. And it's oh, like, yeah. that's when I decided to park it and leave it to you guys. I know Get how away to turn from those it real things. quick. <laughs> yeah, when I was riding, so there were, there were four of them out there. And what was crazy is the dude I was riding with, man, I got to get you his name because he was, he was known, like, because he was signing out autographs. But he would go at this flipping curve like you're going to hit it and at the last moment would turn and get right next to it when mm -hmm. we were doing the – and then uh, when the, the other cars were going with him, there were at one point there were three of them going in a curve together, and I yep. swear I could reach my hand and touch the other car. You probably but, could have, but they never hit. Yeah, and I thought, man, this is some skill. These, this is some skill set from a driving perspective. Oh yeah, because it it it's like you're going so fast, you feel like you're going a hundred plus miles an hour, and you go into that curve, and all three kind of swing, and like you're getting so close to that other car, but you never you never touch. Yeah, you never touch at all. Oh yeah, it was cool, man. Really cool. It's a, it's, it feels a lot faster, more or less, just because the windows are down and you're going sideways, so all the wind is coming directly yeah. at you. Yeah. So it really gives a, like a feeling that you're almost going double the amount of speed that you are, and then the fear factor of like all the smoke and like right. being near the walls and stuff. It's right. it's wild. I think if I tried to do it, it'd be like an old school AT and T commercial. I'm going to reach out and touch someone because <laughs> I'd be hitting but everything. See, the thing is, I I honestly think you guys would be able to comprehend it better than you think okay. because you have racing background. Like you know how a car works. You know how to shift gears. Like you understand the mechanics front to back of a car. So, but I I've always been a testament of if you can learn the basics of something, you can learn the entirety of it. Uh, just out of your own research. So if you just implemented some of the skill set that you already have into it and then just had someone kind of like instructing you on little details, you'd get it in a day. Listen, though, I'd be so nervous. Let me tell you. Oh, why. absolutely. And to, and to your people, nervous. I'd be so nervous. <laughs> Listen, we are drag racers. You know why we're drag racers? We like our panels to be flipping straight when we get back from the past. <laughs> oh. You guys that go, I mean, man, there's so much of a risk. I feel like I would like damage the dang car up, man. Shout out to KBD. That's my body kit sponsor. Yeah. It's, it's and you all guys, polyurethane. But you, you guys literally... need them, though, man. You guys oh, yeah. are a lot, lot like uh, dirt late models and, and circle. I mean, you know, they bring these cars out, right? and they look so yeah. perfect and then they're beat up and then you know guess what fix them for the next one but if you're if they're not beat up you're probably a, a poor driver right so well see that's that's you're a probably not a good driver if you're not damaging some, some panels right or am I sort of that? sort of okay the if you can go to an event drive extremely hard and get just run everyone's door down yeah. you can ding everyone else's car up but if you still go away and your car looks immaculate, that's insane. Like, you are one hell of a driver Okay. to be able to do that and pull that off. Obviously, if someone's behind you, though, and, like, pushing you in, in your door and stuff, that might mess up your car. I, but. I'd still be nervous, though, because I want, I, want, oh, yeah. I want my ride to still be looking good when we get done with the races. So I, I'd, I'd, probably, I'd probably be too conservative. It's a 30-foot so, uh, rule for drifters. Yeah. As long as it looks decent from 30 feet. You're okay? You should be pretty good, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> my whole passenger door is caved in a little bit. Yeah. Just from, I th it was the uh, the K-rails at the Drift Mansion. Okay. Little plastic K-rails. Yeah. I went too deep on the sweeper and booted one of those K-rails <laughs> out into the field, and it just smushed in my door. I didn't realize how heavy those things are. Yeah. But. That's cool. Yeah. Well, as far as the company goes, uh, I know we talked a lot about, like, the grassroots stuff mm -hmm. and, um, like, some of the pride in the way 
the fuel and oils are actually made, but what was the essential goal of the company when you first started it? And did it kind of pan out so far the way you Well, yeah, it's thought. panned out a lot bigger than what we thought. Uh, okay. So we're, in, you, you know, we're nationwide now. I think we're 27, 28 international countries. And, and that's, oh, wow. yeah, that, that, that's rocking too. Uh, great. And, you know, he, he, in a nutshell, we don't come to work every day striving to be the, the biggest race fuel right. company in the world. We come every day thankful for the portion we have. We want to be a good steward of the racers that have put their trust with us. And we don't want to be the biggest. We want to be the best. Right. It's almost like, you know, we want our customers to say, man, Renegade thinks about us. They're super loyal to us and we're loyal to them. So every day, uh, man, we're trying to just take care of of the racers that have put their trust within us. And we're striving to be the best every day. And, and, you know, we're from Kentucky, so we're known for world class bourbon. Okay, we got we are the bourbon capital of the world. So we like to make our racing fields like we do our, our bourbon. So our batches are small batch blend, crafted by hand, made with heart. Every drum, every pail. That's awesome. So do you think, I guess, obviously a lot of the other companies are like shoving just money down marketing. Do you think the, like, keeping the quality of product is always going to be more important for a long-term a growth plan for a company rather than just forcing marketing down people's throat. Absolutely. And yep. not the best product. Yeah, quality is where it's at. I'm not going to list the names, but I could, I, on our consulting side, I've got to see two uh, bourbon companies, uh, P&L statements and their business models. And, and you got one that probably makes three times the volume. Mm-hmm. All right. And then you got another one that makes limited volume. Let's everybody know it's limited volume, but they're focused on a quality. And guess what? Their business model is way more healthier than the other. The bourbon tastes better. It gets better reviews. It's better quality. And guess what? They have more repeat business. So mm. absolutely, it's about the quality. Okay. 100%. That's awesome. Well, I guess what, I guess, motorsport have you seen um, that play out? the most in like what what feedback have you gotten ron you want to i think it's pretty much been universal yeah i think it's been across the board Mm -hmm. like i said we're we're finding more and more i mean up up north the snowmobile and the sleds are are huge uh we didn't realize yeah i didn't realize the market was that big (laughs) we've got a lot of distributors up there moving a ton of product Mm -hmm. um power sports has been big power sports has been big like i said the boating's been big uh, but the you know circle track drag racing you know and, and then finding out like with drifting uh, you know it's an area that's kind of new to us we've only been exposed to it for three or four years and mm. uh, you know realizing what you guys do and and finding out the number of people using our product we didn't even realize was using our product mm. uh, th- then the street rods and vintage racing you know we've got um, a friend of ours who just won another big race in the vintage racing series these old MGs and Austin Healys and um, you know Morgans and all these old restored race vehicles uh, running in those series. So um, I think it's been, like I said, across the board, the growth has been really good. And um, I think it goes back to, as you mentioned earlier, talking about the company, you know, we don't do all the national advertising that some of the other companies do because somebody has to pay for that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, people ask all the time, it says, well, you know, there's this price perception thing, you know, well, if their fuel doesn't cost as much, it can't be as good. Well, that's not accurate again it comes back to how you run your business we don't spend 10 million dollars to to sponsor nascar you know we don't try to go get the nhra national sponsor official fuel uh, spot because that'll cost big money and somebody has to pay for that Mm -hmm. i mean businesses are businesses and they've got to make a profit so that means that if i'm going to spend money i've got to take in money and that's going to come from the customer yeah so when you look at it i mean the chemicals premium chemicals cost what they cost and we're you know, we, we use the best, and, and they, they're not cheap. Uh, but if you still want to be, you know, price competitive, you've got to cut somewhere. And that's one of the areas where we say, back to the grassroots racer, and honestly, in, in the business model, our growth is going to come from, you know, hey, yeah, I'd never heard of them before, but now that I've used them, 
um, you know, I'll, I'll never go to anything else. Mm. You know, we'll get there, that organic growth, because you make the best, you build the best. It's kind of like Pappy Van Winkle, right? Not everybody's yeah. going to get some of them. They get it. It's the best that's, that's out right. there. And, <laughs> that's right. But it's also the most expensive on the market because of the demand. Well, yep. we can supply enough product to keep that demand down so racers don't have to worry about the exorbitant costs. Um, but, you know, they may have to look us up or give us a call. Hey, where's my closest dealer? Because uh, as I said, we're growing, and there's parts of the country that, you know, we'd like to expand more in. Uh, mm -hmm. Just, you know, it takes time. But our, our growth has been tremendous over the last 10 years. Uh, That's good. And it, it shows no signs of letting up. And, and some of the areas that we're able to, you know, like last weekend, Alyssa, uh, our marketing person and our project manager and I were in eastern Ohio doing a seminar for a distributor and about 30 of their customers. You know, we do some things for the racers, help educate them so they make better decisions. And, you know, like I told the guys, I said, you know, they're like, hey, we really appreciate you guys coming here. It says, well, yeah, it, it, we want to do that. That's what we're here for, and that's who we are. But I said, you know, the bottom line, you go back to your business model, um, the better you guys do as racers, the more fuel you burn. Okay? Yeah. Bad racers don't yeah. burn a lot of fuel. So if we can make you more successful, you're going to buy more fuel and you know, we're going to do better as a company uh, from that aspect. So it, it's a it's a win-win for everybody in there. Yeah, and to add to what he's saying, uh, we don't have to spend a lot of national marketing dollars. And, and you want to know why? Because we don't have to. Hmm? Just being straight up. Yeah. When people make the change and use our product. It speaks for itself. It speaks yeah. for itself, and we don't see them go back. Yeah. And so, you know, there is uh, one instance that we had somebody there like, hey, you know, you're – your pricing's pretty good pricing because it wasn't the, you know, take advantage right. of somebody pricing. And they're like, what's wrong with it? And so I got an easy, solu <laughs> I got an easy solution for that. And we this don't is it. Screw you. <laughs> well, it's that, or, Hey, pay us what you think makes you feel good. Mm -hmm. And bro, then what I'll do is I'll take the difference and I'll send you the check back and we'll be your sponsor. And I'll just send you the difference. That way you can feel good about spending fuel or spending that money with us, right? <laughs> so that's an easy solve that's right awesome. there, man. All day long and twice on Sunday, baby. We'll yep. do that. Damn right. <laughs> uh, well, I do want to I want to touch on pricing a little bit, if you're cool with that. Yeah, um, sure. As far as, because I feel like most people's biggest conception is shipping a lot of the times, because shipping, I'm, I assume, is just outrageous for some of this stuff. Uh, what is the average shipping cost for just any of the products really does it all does it vary or it, it does vary okay. because you, you know it, it depends on what part of the country you go to so okay. uh now what's cool now is uh you know our teams we have this uh, new pale direct program in the lower 48 states so uh pretty much you know if you order a pale we have an all-in price so if you go to our website we can ship to people's back doors now uh, so, uh, you know, we do have a program that's available that's an all-in price. Hey, here's your mm -hmm. number at your back door. Is that and common for most for most companies anyways? I don't I – don't, You know, I've I, never personally seen I, that. I, I don't think so, but, uh, hey, we're the first ones to do it. And it's, it's, that, it's, it's, it's been it's great been for success. the customers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, Sick. yeah, just call us and, and, and hopefully we'll have some things, you know, ar ar around some mm -hmm. other opportunities going forward with, mm -hmm. you know, drums and stuff of that nature. But right now, if people want our pails, they can go online, get it shipped to their back door in the, if they're in those 48 states. Okay. And I know ever since, especially the last podcast, <clears throat> I've gotten a couple of DMs about people considering switching over to Renegade and buying a full barrel. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, I know on the website there's no barrel options anywhere on there to just click purchase, add to cart. How does someone go about ordering a barrel or multiple barrels if they're running a business or yeah, so, set up as a dealer account? Yeah, so great question. That. We are looking for more dealers, right? We're in a growth mode right now. So okay. if anybody's interested in being a dealer out there, hey, call us. We'd love to talk to you, okay? And then as far as the shipping goes, uh, if it's a minimum of a pallet, Mm -hmm. of barrels we can ship to somebody's location directly but it's got to be a minimum of a pallet just due to the okay. ltl hazmat shipping costs sweet so yeah okay yeah because like my my barrel came directly to mm -hmm. my door yeah anybody awesome. interested just have them give us a call they can mm -hmm. call us on the 800 number they can go on the website and make an inquiry um we've got a dealer uh, inquiry they can make if they're interested in being a dealer or if they just mm -hmm. need to find a dealer we call it yeah. find a dealer and uh, let us know. One of our sales team will reach out to you. So, you know, you could be in Peachtown, Iowa and say, hey, you know, I, I'd like to get your product, but there's nobody around. 
uh, one of our sales team members will give you a call and we'll find a way to get a drum to you. So whether we have to direct ship, we'll get you connected with a dealer that's closest to you. Um, but yeah, just it's just a matter of picking up the phone or punching in on the internet and we'll get you connected okay. somehow to get the product in your hands. Awesome. Is there any um, specific requirements for dealers? Like I know some companies, like you have to buy a certain amount of product in order to become a dealer. Or is it if someone can take pallet quantities, mm -hmm. there, there there's an opportunity there. And if it's gotcha. not within a current dealer radius where we have a dealer agreement, uh, you, you oh, know, okay, because yeah. we, we do want to respect current dealers that we have. Uh, but there's a lot of there's a lot of pockets out there where mm. we are actively wanting to grow our dealer base. Awesome. Is there anywhere specific that you have in mind currently? Yes, the whole United States. Okay, well, <laughs> of fair America. Enough. Yeah, <laughs> now, no, we, we, you know, so think Kentucky, right? We're we're as you branch out, we're we're pretty strong in Indiana, Kentucky, mm -hmm. Tennessee, but like we're looking for growth opportunities in, in other areas too, right? Yeah. And and just because we might have one or two dealers in the state, there's more opportunity in that state to grow more dealers. So if anybody's interested in being a dealer, call us. We'll see if we can work it out. Awesome. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, well, I do want to jump back on the drifting stuff a little bit. Um, do you think drifting will open up any new opportunities for Renegade as far as product or um, as far as drivers, anything like that? Do you feel like you'll be heading a little heavier into drifting anytime soon? You, you know, as that grows, kind of like our, you know, we when we started this, we were mostly into drag racing mm -hmm. and then, and then power sports <coughs> grew and dirt late model grew and yeah. uh, you know asphalt racing grew so as we grow uh, I, I, an easy way to look at it is hey if we if we grow by a dollar we're going to reinvest part of that dollar back into that race race venue or that race okay. series so yeah as drifting grows we want to pour more back into it and so we're just looking to connect with more uh, drifters to grow that side of the business but yeah absolutely as we grow the grassroots realm in a in a particular part of racing mm -hmm. we, we want to pour back into it okay sweet um is there any like research development that could be done on the drifting side like i know there's a lot of um just chemical research on the way oils work or fuels mm -hmm. work or whatever uh but is there anything unique that drifting could provide in the research category well i'd like to see how i'd like to go one of these races where, where they have the stinky tires because i've never been to one of those. <laughs> so, uh, just go to a local grassroots event what, and you'll what, what, the people will be on walmart tires and stuff like that. is that is that what it. makes it that way like a different the quality of a racing tire versus so that's all the, the compound of the tire um so like GT radials are always, they smell amazing whenever they're burned. Um, the Valinos always smell good. This is, this is such a weird topic, <laughs> the smell of tires. But, um, yeah, if you start going down into a lot of the all seasons and stuff like that, they're going to be a lot harder of a rubber compound mm -hmm. um, and a lot, um, what am I trying to say? The, uh, the compound is just made up of something completely different. Uh which, again, is to make it harder so it disperses water a little bit better so that you can handle just different climates, weather conditions. Uh, but for some reason, whenever they're burned as a stiffer tire or whatever the compound is, it just smells awful. But all the good tires, it smells like fruity vapors. I don't know. It's weird. You know what it could be? I got a conspiracy theory. I'm, I'm ready to hear it. The tires that smell bad. Maybe that'll change when we make America great again, baby. And ah, great. there we go. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love that, dude. That's hilarious. I like that y'all don't shy away from that stuff, too. A lot of motorsports companies will not entertain any type of politics. Hey, everybody's entitled to an opinion. And, you know, love when that. I... When I uh, they say you don't talk about race, religion, politics, and money, right? So mm -hmm. uh, if you ever want to have another podcast, maybe we'll get together and talk about all four. Right? Oh, boy. <laughs> oh, boy. Because if you see me, I got, I, got, I got a little dark skin, right? And for, for your viewers, no, Renegade comes from the Native American thing, right? So yep. I got a bunch of close black buddies and white buddies, and I always tell them, I'm like, man, I'm Native American. I was here for all the blackies and whites. <laughs> so I, I, I can talk about this stuff. But as far as, far as you know, politics go, and we have fun with it in our meetings, Everybody can have an opinion. And, mm. and what we got to get back to is be okay if somebody disagrees with you and still have a great deal of respect for them. 
Yeah. Right. And we got to get out of this mess where somebody has a different opinion. You just want to cut them off and say you're trash. Yeah. Well, that's not the way. That's not even just politics either. Yeah, that's exactly <laughs> right. Pertain that to your life in general. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, let's, we have fun with it. I think we have fun with oh, it. Oh, we have a good time. And, yeah. and, 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 you know, let's have discussions, disagree with each other, and mm-hmm. then, you know, go out and have a drink or have a meal together and have a great deal of respect each other, with each other. That's all we got to get back to, man. Absolutely. Yeah. Keep the peace. That's right. Um, all right. Well, we don't have to go too far down that road, but uh, maybe we'll do that that podcast. Oh man, it would be. Listen, I don't know if we can post that one on YouTube, but but we'd have fun doing it. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh yeah. Post it somewhere. I'll, I'll re restart up the Patreon could be or our something for that one. Our outtake reel, best of. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, all right. Well, uh, I did want to ask, uh, as far as like the events and stuff that you guys do go to, mm-hmm. uh, what, especially not putting so much into marketing too, what events have you seen kind of do the best for you as far as brand exposure, other than like SEMA and PRI? Well, SEMA and PRI are heavy hitters, right? And then we got a few race events that mm-hmm. we work uh, with our with our trackside trailer. Uh, and, and, and something we're doing now is we have uh, brand ambassadors and we're going to have something newer coming up this year called Factory Direct Reps. And we're going to work through those folks, the brand ambassadors uh, and, and our Factory Direct uh, mm. reps to kind of work some of the local events. Because going back to professional racing, grassroots racing, right, sometimes uh, race companies show up to the professional races. Mm. What about the everyday weekend grassroots racing that is going on all across America? Yeah. Uh, you know, that's like I said, that's where our focus is at. Oh, yeah. And well, good. Um, especially like because I hate to just keep bringing drifting back into every topic, but um, a lot of the grassroots events are kind of taking over. So you're seeing like Drift Appalachia. I don't know if you've seen that, mm. but um, yeah. essentially they – find mountain roads they oh, contact cool. the city get the mountain roads shut down for two days and they go out and drive drift mountain roads it's absolutely insane have ralph send me a link on that i'd like to check that out absolutely yeah. um and they're very like closed off in a sense uh you can't have much expectation or anything like that but the media from them is insane um they're really good at incorporating their sponsorships with flags and stuff around the turns and all that um but events like that are starting to really take over more, um, and even stuff like LS Fest. And I'll, I wouldn't even consider those pro events. Those are more grassroots mm-hmm. uh, than anything. Yeah, um, we, and we work the LS Fest. Yeah, the, yeah. The beach band, yeah. So I would definitely being able to incorporate through drivers into those type of events would mm-hmm. be amazing well that's been one of the things that's been key for us and, and that's what we've been really uh pleased to be here with you on circle of pod uh circle of drift <laughs> podcast <laughs> circle of podcast uh the circle Dunk of drift sure. podcast is uh it, you know like every company you got to learn more about the types of racing and, and like we keep talking about all the different venues there's so many things out there yeah, too, yeah. um you, you tend to do you you know like i said we're drag racers so it's easy for us uh, you know, the headquarters in Bowling Green, right there at Beach Bend Raceway. Mm-hmm. But there's so many other venues of racing. So that's one of the things that we've really focused on, as Toby mentioned, with our brand ambassadors and now the factory rep uh, program is a factory direct program to get out there, get more immersed in the different types and different venues of racing, get to know the racers better. Mm-hmm. Uh, back to your question earlier, you know, with the needs of a drift racer, you know, well, we're going to find that out by going out and interacting with you all and find out, you know, what are your needs and uh, what are your challenges? Is there something out there you guys are struggling with that is in our wheelhouse that, hey, we could help develop that or we could help perfect that? So it, it's a people business, always has been, always will be, and that's where we see um, our greatest growth is just that interaction and doing more and more with the different venues of racing uh, that's out there versus buying some national advertisement or putting a billboard up somewhere. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Hey, okay, I got a question for you on the drifting. What you got? Um, are there guys that have like an NOS kit and they're they're hitting some monkey grass spray when they're going around there? Is that like mm-hmm. outlawed or not allowed? Okay, yeah, yeah you can use it. Yeah, is, is there advantage because you, you know you're spending? The, is there advantages to doing that? So essentially, for well, when people will set it up for drifting, it'll mm-hmm. more or less be on a throttle switch. Okay. Um, so ideally, you well. Sorry, let me let me step back a little bit. Uh, 
it'll be set up for certain like engine platforms. So a turbo car, you might want to add a little bit of nitrous at first light off. So if you're clutched in, you're about to dump the clutch, you might want a little bit so that it can keep up with the turbo lag. Mm. Other than that, if it's just like an LS setup, you completely NA, power's already there. You'll never really want the NOS to kick on unless you're full throttle. Because that's when you're really going to need that amount yeah. of power. If you're just feathering it, you're in the yeah, place you that you need that to switch. be in. So yeah. there's no need for the, the nitrous. It'll just screw you up. But it is point. used in that. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Cool. Yeah. A lot heavier than you think. <laughs> uh, majority of FD cars, I would say, correct me if I'm wrong, um, I think have NOS. Okay. Um, yeah. You know what kind of fuel they're using for those applications? Uh, a lot of those are going to be ethanol. Okay. The majority of cars are going to be ran off eth ethanol okay. at that level. Yeah. And that's one of the things that we've got, I think we talked about it last podcast, is you know we do an E112, which is a leaded version of E85, and mm -hmm. it'll support yeah. ridiculous amounts of boost and nitrous and stuff. So, uh, again, learning more about that world. Um, I also, th I, my, my gears are turning about the good old nitrous additive we have on our race fuel side. Yeah, exactly. Mm. So, okay, so we've got some experience idea. in the nitrous world. And well, got some good fuels for tell that, me so. about it then, because I mean, they yeah. might be able to answer better than I can. I'm like, I'm four years of driving into drifting, so like I am still. I'll always say it. I'm no genius in drifting. I'm not the greatest driver. So explain it to me. Maybe I'll have an answer, but I guarantee you, someone will. So I'm going to let Ron take this over right here because okay. he's the best at, exp at explain. Kind of explain to them maybe on the race gas side what that nitrous additive does. And, yeah. And that might be something we could incorporate into our ethanol On the side. ethanol side, yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah, like, well, when you go in, like, so when you're hitting spraying the nitrous, and depending on how heavy a nitrous you're spraying, first thing it's hitting the intake, you know, at minus 20-some degrees. So mm. it's a really cold blast in a really hot area. It's kind of like the billows on a blacksmith. You know, you pump in the oxygen on top of the hot fire. You start to try to melt stuff. Stuff gets really hot. Mm. Um, it dries things out a lot, creates a lot of abrasion there. So our additive helps reduce those nitrous implosions by kind of buffering that event. When you mm -hmm. hit the nitrous and that cold charge hits and the temperatures rise up and you ever, you know, if you ever look at a dyno program or a dyno, when they hit, somebody hits the button, it's not a power curve. It's a, yeah, it's a, spike. It's, yeah, yeah. It's a vertical spike. So uh, that kind of levels that out. It doesn't, it doesn't necessarily change the spike any, but inside the combustion chamber, it helps buffer that reaction a little bit. So huh. um, where that heat's really trying to burn things down and dry stuff out, it adds some lubricity there. Mm -hmm. um, and it helps keep that nitrous a little more stable so it doesn't light off. And, you know, you've seen the hoods blow off and everything else from, you know, you hit yeah, the nitrous yeah. and, and launch it. Um, our products tend to reduce that. It doesn't totally, you know, you're never going to 100% eliminate it, yeah. but it definitely reduces those nitrous implosions and, and makes the a little more friendly to use the heavier loads of nitrous than what uh, mm. people might, you know, what they want and what they can get by with. Now they can get a little closer to want and not just getting by. Gotcha. Okay. And this discussion is going to have us going after here. Yeah, y'all going to go in the lab. <laughs> we got to go grab uh, some beakers, man. Dude, tell me about it. Uh, that's that's unique, though. I've mm -hmm. never personally had a, a nitrous car, so, like, I – Again, I wouldn't be able to answer that, actually. Um, but I am curious to you guys if you do have an answer to that or if you have any suggestion that would help point them in the right direction for that, leave it in the comments so they can read it and be able to come back to it. Um, but I guess I, I did want to jump back on the drivers um, and incorporating a lot of more of that stuff this year. To those drivers out there that aren't um, – working with you guys currently, what are some of the things that you look for in a driver when it comes to sponsorship or anything like that? Yeah, so we really don't have a, like a, a universal sponsorship program. We have a brand mm -hmm. ambassador program because we want, we, whenever we, we work with drivers, we want them to feel a true sense of partnership. So mm -hmm. we want to see folks that, you know, carry the brand proudly uh, and also can provide us R&D research back too, because that's right. important to us too, right? Mm -hmm. That we can get feedback on our fuels. So mm -hmm. we want people to see that we burn cooler, cleaner, more consistent. Um, and then, you know, the, the, the other part of that too is we have a universal 
uh, that we poured more into. It's our racer contingency program. That's our own contingency program. Mm -hmm. So anybody that, that that's racing can go online, sign up for that, and they can get rewarded for using our fuels. That's awesome. Yeah. Any okay. venue of racing. Drift, any venue of racing. Drifters, yeah. any, anybody yeah. burning the product. You, you win any event anywhere. It doesn't have to be a series, anything that we sponsor. Or a championship. We yep. want, if somebody's racing and they're doing good and they, they win, we want them to get rewarded. Yep. They win. No matter where they're racing. Sign up online on our website. It's free to sign up. Mm -hmm. Get some decals in there. As long as the decals are on the car, you win anywhere, any event. You just send it in. We do a verification of the win, and we send you the product certificate out. For That's your, so cool. Fuel purchase. And so. then we do a highlight on Winning Wednesday yep. on our socials. Yep. Those are they're going to make the Winning Wednesdays. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Awesome. Yep. Well, that's cool, man. I, lo I love that. Uh, well, if someone was considering jumping to not only Renegade, but a race fuel or oils, what would your best piece of advice be? Well, first thing is we don't want to sell anybody on anything. We want to educate them. OK, yep. and sometimes in the performance world, right, we want to get hype and, uh, you know, hey, this is product's going to do this and make more power. No, we want to educate them because, mm -hmm. right, when they're buying our racing fuel or <clears throat> our oils, or anything, that, 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 that's a big decision because they are trusting us. Uh, the lifeblood, all right, the fuel mm -hmm. and oil is the lifeblood of the motor. Just like we talked about the lifeblood of the blood in us. Right. Yep. So we want to make sure that stuff is top quality. They trust it and that they also see the benefits of it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do you have anything from like the chemical side of that? No, like I said, the, it comes back to the education, making sure we get them in the right product for their application. We kind of talked about yeah. that a little bit in mm -hmm. the first podcast. Of we want to know what you're doing, what are you running, what you're, you know, what are you doing, what are you doing it with, how are you doing it, how often do you do it, and those things, so we can get the right fit for you. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's kind of like putting on a pair of shoes. You get the wrong shoes. You know, you're miserable the whole time, and you probably don't run as good as you could. <laughs> uh, if we get that fuel, the right fuel in the car, it, it's not going to necessarily make you a better driver. But if you can take the car off the platform and focus on driving, you're going to be a better driver. So we want to get that vehicle running as good as we can with with the products that we uh, offer. Mm -hmm. So that's that's why you know it comes back to like Toby mentioned the education is you know. Help us educate you on what you really need, not maybe what another company's told you you need. Yeah. Um, and that might be right or wrong, and, and we'll concur. I mean, we're the first ones to say, if you have something that's working, you know, we ask people all the time, it says, you don't want to change. Well, why do you want to change? You know, if it's working for you, what, what do you want to do differently? Because mm -hmm. as we said, we're not out here to, to sell snake oil and promises and dreams. We're out here to sell a real product that works and, uh, you know, help your program improve. So, you know, we're going to be able to do that in one way or the other. You may have a great fuel now, but we can probably beat that on a cost perspective. Mm -hmm. Maybe you've got a fuel out there you think is a great fuel, but we can offer something that's a little bit better for your application, and your performance improves as well as your wallet. Uh, you know, it comes back to, we get a question all the time, you know, it's like, you know, high-octane fuel makes power, and we talked about that the last yeah. uh, yeah. podcast. No, octane supports the power level you make. It doesn't make the power um, but it'll drain your wallet really fast. So, uh, you know, we could, and it goes back to our business, you know, ethics here. Yeah, we could drain your wallet the first time heavily and take the money mm -hmm. and run. But we found it's a lot more advantageous for everybody is if we just take a normal cut each time and you race for the next 20 years, we're going to win in right, the end. Right. As well as you're going to win in the end. Yeah, and to add to that, there's a lot of racers that are, in our opinion, they're burning money out the tailpipe because there's been this – marketing promotion of high octane high this and, and that's not where we need to be we yeah. need to put the right product for the right application and a lot of times when people make the change for us mm -hmm. they're way overpaying for a product that's not the right product for the mm -hmm. applications that's safely to say yeah. and then they get a product that's for the application and it's actually a lot better on their pocketbooks and they're getting Better performance. The efficiency is better. Yeah, yeah, that's crazy. Absolutely. But yeah. let, let's not confuse everybody to think we can't make high-octane fuel. We oh, we can. super right, high-octane right. fuel. Yeah. And, and what was really uh, interesting is some of the fuel development we've done on a couple of our new products, the octane test actually came back from the lab saying it exceeds all testing capability and had to be manually calculated because the octane was so high. <laughs> so we can get you there. No. As far as um, if people wanted, if people are deciding to make that change, what would be the best route for them to get info on which fuel to use or anything like that? Like, can they just call up and say, hey, I've got this platform. What fuel do you suggest? 
Yeah, so we have a we have an eight hundred number. If you go to our, first thing, go to our website, and, mm -hmm. and there's a be a dealer form or become a dealer form. They can go there and check that out. The contingency program is on there. Also, talk about education. I think our education part of our website is second to none. I mean, they, fun fact: that's where I got majority of the questions. For there the you last go. Podcast. There you go. Go to the website, man, because we put a lot of stuff uh, up there. But also, we have a, a on our website a one eight hundred number, and it says "Talk to a Live Voice." We got a great, great CSR group, mm -hmm. and so uh, Monday through Friday, I think eight to uh, four thirty Central, it's on the website. They can mm -hmm. call and talk to a Live Voice, and then we'll get the calls distributed out where they need to go. That's awesome. Yeah. Okay. And we're there, and the tech support's there 24 7. So mm -hmm. you can call yeah. the tech line anytime, 270 467 4221. And uh, you may leave a message. We'll call you right back within 24 hours, but we will help any racer anywhere get the right information for their program. I think we're kind of in good shape if the tech man knows the tech number by heart. So I feel pretty good. About <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and thanks for letting me have my coffee up here today, man. Oh, I've been, dude, no I've been under the weather for two days. and uh, Trust me, I understand. Yeah, I heard you've been under the weather, too. Oh, my too. God. SEMA ruined me. It was my first one. Yeah. Which, by the way, how did SEMA go for you guys? So our folks that were there uh, are not, you know, I haven't talked to them, but I told it, yeah, I yeah. was told it went well, that we had a lot of foot traffic there. So we got a recap. We'll, we'll do a recap after every trade show. You're in a good spot. Yeah. I, Hall, I did, so. I, so I, I got a recap email and like I said, I've been under the weather bad Monday, Tuesday, but I do remember the email that we had, uh, the space was good where we were at and we had a lot of foot traffic, which oh, yeah. is always awesome. So well, that's good. Yeah. Y'all plan to go back next year? Absolutely. Y'all going to be at PRI too? We'll be at Absolutely. PRI. Yep. Will you be there? <laughs> yeah. Come by and see there. us, man. Come see us. Absolutely. Yep. Definitely will. And if you guys are going too, come by and see them, check out their product, see what they got. Ask them the questions you want to ask. If I missed anything for sure. Um, okay. Uh, and then what is y'all your personal goal for the company moving forward? So, yeah, uh, we, we, we just built a, a state-of-the-art blend plant expansion due to the growth. Mm -hmm. uh, like anything else, you buy a new race car, you buy a new toy. You know, a lot of times the, the, the truck pullers are the RVs, right? They say don't buy them new because you got yeah. to <laughs> figure them out, right? They don't ever work perfect. So we've been uh, modifying that. Uh, that thing should be 100% to unleash in 2025. So, uh, awesome. you know, before you leave today, if you want to, if you hadn't been back there, we'll take you on a tour back there and you can yeah. see the blend plant expansion, man. And uh, we're pumped up about that. And want to, uh, we're building the, the new bottling facility. Uh, and then uh, one day I would love to build another blend plant like this one in another part of the country. And that's kind of on the horizon. So uh, Out on the West Coast, probably. That's right. Man. Yep. <laughs> uh, but we're not, we're not looking to slow down. Good. Good. Well, I love to see it. I hope it succeeds the way you want it to. It's awesome. Um, I do want to ask, do you have any more questions for the drifting side of things? I may not be able to answer them fully, but I know someone will in the comments. You know, I had the, the, the NOS question that came up when we were talking about drifting. And, you know, I, uh, with the discussion, I'm looking forward to hearing some of the comments there because uh, I think we got some ideas now we might have to yeah. talk about. <laughs> yeah, and there's a couple products <clears> – <throat> Coming up for spring, so like I said, for the ethanol users, it's good to know that there's oh, that much yeah. ethanol usage. Yeah. Mm. Um, we've got a, a new product that will be coming on board that, that will increase your power by using it. So. Yeah, our, get our, some hints on it. Let me just say, let me just let me just say this though: the ethanol lines that we have are about to be expanded, and the quality, the step up. I mean, what we have now is already excellent. Mm -hmm. But like he said, there's going to be some real power adders to our ethanol line. And I'm, you know, now that we've talked about the NOS thing, I think we can go even deeper with it to, to help with the NOS well, applications. I, I can say that the numbers on the dyno were impressive and real. Yeah. Sweet. <laughs> That's so yeah, cool. Yeah. <laughs> and, and for your followers, here, here's something uh, I do want to comment on. Sometimes you have to be careful – and I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna use a, a summary here, okay? In the fuel industry, you have to be real careful when people get samples to go dyno with mm -hmm. versus the fuel they buy and arrives to them. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. What do you mean? You, all right. Explain you, you, that. A little all right. Bit. So if I want to impress you and send you a sample to dyno, sometimes there's there's been some samples that get juiced up, but when you go to buy the product, it might no be a little way. bit different. Okay. Uh, How's that legal? 
Well, I'm not getting into that part. I'm just saying that's going to be that's that's part of <laughs> that's part of some history, right? We pride ourselves on what you get as a sample is going to be what you get in the drum or the pail, okay? Because that's good. We, know, we yeah. want it to be consistent, right? And so the other part is is when you talk about dynoing, right? Mm -hmm. We can make products that look really great at 7,000 RPM, right? Right, and people look at that high end horsepower torque number. Mm -hmm. But how often is your throttle full throttle for the whole 100% duration of, say, drifting? Yeah. No, you got the gas on and off, right? Yeah. So we look at high end, mid level, and how the reaction is on the throttle response. Because, right, you can have all this power on the top end of the RPM range, but it don't mean a hill of beans if you're not getting that uh, throttle response and that torque advantage in the mid range of the RPMs level, say 3,000 to 6,000. Right, gotcha. so we want it to be sharp all the way through the RPM range, and that's why you'll hear when racers change over, they love the throttle response and the duration and, and the consistency yeah, of how yeah. our horsepower and torque is through the whole RPM. Mm -hmm. And we do yeah, a lot of incredible. testing for that. That's why this product's been in development yeah. for about a year to, to make sure, because you can run a test and somebody says, oh, it's fantastic or great, and then somebody puts in a different combination, it doesn't work. Yep. We want to get it in multiple combinations, and, and uh, you know, when somebody says something about, you know, well, the dyno results, you know, to Toby's point, a lot of times we'll, we'll have people, uh, somebody that's dynoed something, they'll say, well, we dynoed your fuel and another fuel, and, you know, it, it did this or it did that, and it's like, okay, well, let's, uh, let's talk about that for a minute. Like, well, yeah, we put it in, we made six pulls on it, and we tuned, got everything tuned, got it, engine just really peaked out, then we drained the fuel and put yours in. Well, wait a minute, you made seven pulls to peak, to Top, you know, get yeah. theirs perfect, and you want to pour ours in. Our fuel isn't their fuel. Yeah, you got to do the seven pulls to our fuel to do the same thing. So and you got to tune to it. So it's you know it's yeah. like and reading hot rod, hot rod magazines. You, you know, you, you read they're evaluating intake manifolds. And, yeah, and it's one of my favorite articles I remember reading. And they're going through and making this change. You got to test mule, and I think it's typical ubiquitous small block Chevy. And they're they're making these cam changes, and then they get to this cam who happens to be the one that's advertising the most in the magazine that month. Mm. And they get to, well, in order to optimize this intake, we had to change, or I'm sorry, the intake testing. To optimize this intake, we had to make a cam change. Well, wait a minute. That's not comparing apples to apples. You just right. changed the entire breathing of the yeah. engine to make sure the intake come out. So th those are things that, you know, we're aware of that's out there. And, and mm. like I said, we make sure when we test, we use multiple engine builders so that, you know, one guy, you know, there's a, I'm from India, and there was a an engine, famous engine builder out there. And everybody always talked about you know, well, we know his his dyno's 100 horse happy. <laughs> so, because, uh, you know, horsepower sells. And yep. uh, so, you know, we use multiple engine builders so we can avoid the happy dyno where the one guy's dyno and giving you great numbers. It up a bit. Yeah, yeah and, and because his dyno, you know, correlations and calibrations are a little off. Because one of the things, and I don't know if we mentioned last, but just so everybody knows, you cannot measure horsepower. How do you mean? <laughs> I knew that. That's why I asked that question. You can only measure torque. Horsepower is a calculation based off mm. torque. It's oh, torque okay. times yeah, RPM sense. divided yeah. by 52, 52. Because at 5,252 RPM, torque and horsepower cross, yeah. they're even. Okay, so it's a calculation. So when we talk about these big horsepower numbers, you know, we can tweak the correlation, tweak the factor yeah. uh, on the dyno. we got to correct it to a certain error, make sure we're evaluating evenly across the board. You know, we, didn't, we did it at 86 degrees in Texas here in July, and yet we did it in Minnesota when it was 30 and the air was cold and dense, mm -hmm. that's not exactly a fair comparison. So true, we true. gotta make sure all those are, uh, are evened out. So that's why we take our time and, and we use multiple engine builders. You know, we're not, we're not saying or bad mouthing anybody. We don't bad mouth our competition. We're yeah. not bad mouthing an engine builder uh, with his dyno. And in fact, one of the guys I use just got a new dyno from Superflow and, and the new dyno is coming back 60, 70 horse short of his old dyno, which we always felt was pretty honest. And, you know, he's been working with them to figure out what's different, whatever. So yeah. those things are going to happen, not necessarily the engine builder's fault. Not, you know, he's not intentionally doing those things. But in testing, like anything, you involve more people in it, you get a broader perspective, then you know you got a real product. And uh, we're pretty excited about some of the real products that are going to be coming mm -hmm. out. Dude, Absolutely. That's awesome. Well, I'm excited to see it. Uh, do you have, a, like, a time frame that you think? When it'll be announced? We're hoping first quarter, first quarter uh, this spring to bring them out. So just in okay. time for race season for a couple of the products. Cool. Well, let me know so I can uh, absolutely mention it on the podcast. Absolutely. Right? Oh yeah. 
All right, well, uh, I guess we'll jump into the, the last few questions that I do in every episode. This one's a little unique to you guys, so I'm going to twist it up a little bit. Um, <laughs> but, the phone part. Is this the one <laughs> I failed miserably the last time? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, um, the seat time car. Uh, if you could build any seat time car, for you guys, I'm going to just exclude the drifting aspect. Any type of seat time car that you want to build, doesn't necessarily matter the budget, what car would it be, and what main parts would you buy for it? You go first, Ron. Oh, I feel last From Njukov, sorry. I did. Yeah, from, from their sponsor, Njukov. So, again, probably in that world, it's probably... You can try and build a seat time drift car if you want. <laughs> yeah, Give you know, they got, some really, they got some really good Coyote stuff. So I might have to go on this one, move away from the Super and, and get into a Fox body <laughs> with a Coyote on there and, and see where we could get with that. Maybe Man, put a, a Charger on there. It's weird because the Coyotes just aren't That's hardly nice. used in drifting. Yeah, I know. I don't know if it's because of the size and weight or... They're, well, yeah, they are massive. They're massive. Um, but they're just so expensive compared yeah. to an LS. Yeah, yeah, so. definitely. Yeah, it definitely runs the cost up. But, again, you didn't give me a, a dollar restraint. You gave me yeah, a catalog. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I just excluded all the rules to there it. <laughs> what do you think? Shoot, What would man, be your I, dream seat time build? I like the Fox body. I like the – I almost might would put some turbos on it, though. I have never driven a, car, a turbo car. And I, I'm wondering what that would be like. You know, I've owned blowers, I've owned injection, <laughs> carburation, but I've never driven a turbo application. It hits different, especially yeah. in drifting. It's because whenever I enter, I'm on handbrake clutching in, but I'm surging the turbo mm -hmm. and like just slowly letting off the clutch until I get that engagement point and I can feel the boost kick yep. in yep. and just light off. And is, is there a delay in the boost? Me. Is there a del slight delay in the boost when you're on the throttle? Or does it um, kick in? Mine's pretty responsive. Okay. Boost kicks in at like 2,300 RPMs for my yep. car. So yep. it's, yep. I don't notice too much lag in it, but. This is also my first turbo car too, so like yeah. I don't really have much else to compare it to, so. But yeah, throw gotcha. some turbos on it, and Juku's got the Garrett's dog. That's what I put on mine. There you go. Yeah. Um, okay. I'd, I'd like to do that sometime. I'd like. I would like to drive a car with some turbos on it. Just to say I did it. Oh yeah. Well. You Drive my car if you want. Okay, sounds good. <laughs> I promise uh, not to bench you. You might get addicted to the JDM culture now. I, I, I don't know I, I, about I, I, that. I'm going to your panel. I'd be too nervous. Don't uh, mess up that's your awesome. Stuff. Uh, okay, and then if you had to give the best advice to anyone just getting into motorsports in general, what would your advice be? So from a racing perspective or from a business perspective? Let's go with a racing perspective. Yeah, uh, I, I would say, you know, Work hard, do your best. Know that uh, in racing, um, it's not always a hero sum game. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> good example, I, I've been out of racing for a couple of years, taking care of, of some family members. Come back this year, we get the car out, go to our first race and win. So we think we're big stuff. We go to the second event, go to qualify and shear the crankshaft and break a bunch of parts. Oh. Yeah, so it, so, so it happens. And just understand, you know, when you're racing, man, do it for the passion. And mm -hmm. have fun with it. There's, there's nothing better than a racing man because it's also a, it's also a family sport too. You can go That's with why family. grassroots is best. Yeah, it keeps grass, you there. Amen, brother. And 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 you know, it, it just have fun with it. And uh, yeah, take it serious. You go out there to win. Uh, but uh, if you're not having fun with it, why do it? Absolutely, I agree. That that probably be my single biggest piece of advice. Awesome. I think that's a good one. What you got? I, I would say just get. It. Get out there, get involved in it, make sure it's something that excites you, and then talk to the people that are doing it. Find out what it's all mm -hmm. about. Find out the good, the bad, the ugly, and, and ask a lot of questions. And, and do your, like I said, do your research as much as you can. You know, we've only got so much money to play with, and uh, it's true. fun when it works. It's getting better. It's, it's get fun better. when it works, but when the crankshaft breaks, it ain't any fun. <laughs> so right. if, uh, like I said, you, you get out there and talk to people what works and what doesn't work, and It'll make your experience a whole lot better and a whole lot more fun your first few times out if, you, if you've got something. may not be a winning car, but at least it's competitive because you got the right stuff. Yeah. You're looking at the right parts from the right companies and, and making good decisions going in because you, 
you talk to people about what works and what doesn't work, not just what looked good in an ad somewhere. Yeah, yeah. 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 I do have one more piece of advice. Absolutely. Only use renegade racing fuel and oils, baby. <laughs> That would be my last piece of advice. And in scene. <laughs> Podcast <laughs> over. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Uh, okay, and then the last one I got for you is it's a little deeper. If you had the opportunity to speak to the entire world, what would your one message be? Ooh, that's a deep one. Let's see here. That's a deep question. There are going to be people in life that know you and people in life that know of you. Be mm. passionate and focus of the people that know you. We all have probably had friends in life that say they're your friends, and they agree with you, shake their head yes with you. Uh, but when you have three friends with you and you get in a fight with ten, two of those three leave because they see the odds. Mm. But you'll always have that one crazy SOB that's got enough backbone and tenacity to say, we might get our tails whipped today, but those 10 are going to know these two were here. Yep. Surround yourself with those type of people. That that's would be my, that would be That would be my best advice. Awesome. Wow. Okay. That's one of the better ones I've gotten so far. I like that. What do you think? Um, I, one of the things I think – to say is, you know, you've got to work hard to have what you want in life or whatever. But one of the things that I saw um, that really kind of set with me and, and I think would be good to share is um, don't be, don't get so busy making a life that you forget to live a life. Mm, that's good. And I, and I think a lot of people really kind of lose that balance. And, you know, kids grow quick. Families go quick. And, you know, in a motorsports, family's everything. It's mm -hmm. fun. And, um, you know, there's nothing like it. I'm fortunate that my family loves it and, and travels with us when we, we race. Um, and that just, that makes it a world of fun. So, um, yeah, try to, try to find balance and make sure that, uh, you know, kind of keep everybody. I think a lot of people, when they, they get into racing, whatever, you'll see guys by themselves all the time. Yeah. My wife hates her. The kids don't like it, whatever. Well, did you really try that hard to, to give them or, or are you helping them understand the experience or whatever yeah. on there? So, like I said, just try to find a balance. And um, I think, you know, really makes it a lot more fun and a lot more enjoyable. And Absolutely. More successful. Absolutely. It's very nice. hard, but very important. Yeah. I agree. Well, good. Um, well, I guess – do you guys have any last questions or anything like that? Yes, that we, we, we have a special gift for you. Ooh, so we have I'll a, get my own. We have a special red cap here that <laughs> says make racing feel great again, courtesy of Renegade. We want to give you this as a gift. Thank you for coming. Absolutely. Thank you for being a partner. And uh, got to give a lot of kudos uh, and thanks to uh, Alyssa, AJ, slash Ralph that helped us create these per my, per, per my request. <laughs> She's sitting behind the camera. Per my request, okay? So I, uh, but we wanted to give you this gift and this great hat. And, uh, and, and if, you, if you get a picture of it uh, with it on you, send us a picture so we can share Absolute. it, okay? All right, there Here, you go, man. I got you. We'll just throw it on. You might have to flatten the bill. I know, I know in the drift <laughs> world you got to kind of oh, go more fine. with a flat bill. Yeah, we're good. Man, you look like fresh biscuits. It's like it's meant to be. Yes, sir. Look All right. <laughs> <laughs> um, I voted correctly, just saying. Anyways. <laughs> well, if you guys want, uh, plug yourself, plug company, plug anyone you want to shout out. Go ahead. I was just saying, give us a call. Let's see if we can help your program out. Give it uh, on the website. See our contingency program. Check out our race fields. Check out our race oils. And um, like I said, if you got a question, even if you're using somebody else's product, but you've got fuel or oil questions, whatever, hey, we're here to help, okay? You'll make a good decision eventually. Yeah, and nice to be with you guys. Appreciate you guys having us. It's awesome. Uh, we want you guys to be a part of the Renegade family, and uh, we're just excited about learning more about the drift side today. And, and thank you for having us. And, hey, racers that win, pour it in. Thank you all. Absolutely. Well, that's pretty much all we got for this one, guys. Uh, again, I really appreciate you letting me come out and do these episodes. Uh, it's nice to be able to share some info on fuel because it doesn't get shared enough. But, of course, look below the video. Make sure the subscribe button is not still red. If it is, click it and the bell notification. Links to everything you always will need are always in the description. <clears throat> 
especially their website, go check that out. See what products they have. See what products would work best for you. If you still don't know, give them a call. They'll have the answers. So, um, and again, Chase Bay's customer appreciation event. Buy your tickets if you haven't already. That's my last event for the year. So that's all we got. I will see you each and every Sunday for a brand new episode. Thanks. Peace.